You're listening to Cards to the Moon, a podcast about trading cards from both a collector and investor perspective. We hope you'll stick around for the ride as we take a deep dive into the state of the hobby, share some hot takes, hopefully some useful advice and fun stories along the way. All right, welcome to Cards to the Moon. This is episode 58. I'm Clark from Five Card Guys on Instagram. And joining me is John, who is Trade You at Recess. And as we mentioned in this past Friday's episode, Hyung is busy setting up his office, which he completely renovated. So he'll be joining us hopefully next week. All right, off the top for today's episode, I just wanted to draw attention to this Instagram post from at uncle underscore Ray Ray underscore sports cards who submitted 22 cards to PSA and he alleged that PSA sent it all back ungraded because they stated there was evidence of trimming on each of the cards. I think it was on all 22 of those cards from the photo that I saw. Now, uncle underscore Ray Ray noted that 85% of those cards he submitted were pack fresh and the rest were in BGS nine holders that I presume he cracked out and resubmitted he also mentioned that psa still charged him two thousand five hundred dollars for the whole process so there's a lot of questions here but john what are your initial thoughts on this whole situation yeah uh i can't, was it you or young that first sent it and brought it to our attention i think it was young yeah. yeah my initial obviously was like un- unreal like I, I couldn't, right. you know, like that's, that's unbelievable. And you, you, you get upset at PSA and then to find out that the dude got charged 2,500, like the full grading fee um, for cards that were, I guess, you know, like, I don't know, it's, it's arguable whether they were graded or not. Like they, they'll check the edges and then they'll see that it's trimmed. And how could you, hmm. you know, cause I heard, I don't know about trimming trim cards, but I heard that previously if they they deem it you know if they don't qualify for whatever re- for whatever reason they don't charge is what i've heard um so th- there were some comments uh, about how P- you know like people upset how could psa charge the guy but you know after thinking about it more uh, it's hard to you know like i'm still siding obviously with uncle ray ray but i don't know i don't i don't have him on instagram i'm at it now um i don't know any about the guy how legitimate yeah. he is um how true all of this is like you know no disrespect mm-hmm. to uncle ray ray but maybe they are actually trim cards and psa is just doing their job and he's just kind of making the like who knows what the real truth is right, but obviously right. on the onset it just looks really really bad on psa um, but we don't know what the yeah. real truth is here yeah no th- i was gonna say the same thing like i mentioned there was a lot of questions here that we don't have the answers to right. or we're not privy to right the context of everything yeah i don't know who uncle underscore ray ray is and you know just reading the comments it seems divided a little bit where some people are saying well don't trim your cards buddy you know <laughs> if you don't if you don't want it back so obviously they're siding with psa and then there's others that you know just uh, anti- anti-psa right? right so it's like how how can exactly what you're mentioning how can they do such a thing right I, you know Bottom line for me is it just feels like this is another example where we just need a little more transparency from PSA. Lacking any details of the situation, right. you know, we talked about it before, like we don't know why some of the cards get graded the way they do, even when they do come out with a actual grade, whether it's a 10 or a 9 or an 8, or in some cases, a, you know, I think Hyung got a 7 or 4. I can't even remember. He got a really bad grade for one of the cards and no explanation, right? And, right. You know, of course, this is uh, more of an extreme example, but I think they can improve that transparency process of why and how they grade their cards. You know, what was the evidence in this case that it was trimmed, you know, and just to educate us a little bit more about that. And, you know, another thing is like, it just feels like PSA just needs better customer service. You know, it's like, it's not good when collectors are (laughs) venting on their social media. You know, I think it could probably could have been avoided if, um, you know, it didn't seem like they reached out to him and talked uh, in detail of what actually happened, right? So, so yeah, it looks like they need uh, to up their customer service and, and maybe something like this will um, get them to consider investing in that area of their company. Right. But yeah, all, all around, 
it's kind of a mess. And, um, you know, unless unless people stop using PSA, I don't know if any changes are going to happen right, right away, right. unfortunately. It is. I mean, it's all 22 or 23 cards, whatever it was, it is kind of absurd, though, like both ways. It's absurd uh, looking at it from PSA saying like, man, how could you do that to the guy? But at the same time, if you are a trimmer, it would make sense that you have trimmed all of your cards and then they would all get caught at the same time, right? Like how could it, how is it possible that 22 straight cards are deemed trimmed by so-called professionals, right? So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's It's, hard to believe. Yeah. It's hard to believe both ways, (laughs) Uh, but going back to to your accountability thing. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Like I have a gripe with PSA. Like the, the, the one time we did a bulk submission back in the day, um, I sent in a 90, is it 91? When's Shaq's rookie? Anyways, you know the Shaq upper deck rookie where he has a three, oh, yeah. the three yeah. images? It's not the 1B trade card. Think, it's, yeah. it's like the main um, the main number one draft pick card that I pulled from a pack um, when I was a kid. Mint condition, flawless. I thought I had a real good shot at a PSA 10. I sent it in along with, you know, like a hundred other cards. And uh, I don't know, I don't know if you remember, but it came back a PSA seven and it had a visibly mm. dinged corner. Like as if I dropped the card from 10 feet and it hit the ground, like concrete floor. Um, yeah, yeah. I didn't send, I would never send in that card in that condition. And, you know, it was one of those things where I talked to Hyung about it and he's like, should I even fight this with, um, PSA? He's like, dude, you're not even going to get a response from them. Like, it's not even worth it. And you know, I didn't, ha- I didn't have, yeah. unfortunately, I didn't have a video of it, like me putting it in the card saver. There's no real proof on my end that it was mint going in. So, like, what am I supposed to say, right? It's not. But my other cards, none of them had dented corners, so it's not like, you know, PSA can claim that it was dented by USPS or whatever, right? So it was, it was one of those tough situations where, like, again, that was, you know, it was only one card, but it was a big card. If that was a, at the time, if that was a PSA ten, it's four thousand dollars. Um, but if it was a PSA nine, I think it would have been like a hundred, hundred fifty dollars. Um, so I'm not a professional grader. I thought it probably was for sure a, a PSA nine. Um, so at the at the t- at the same time, I was like, okay, you know, maybe it would have been a PSA nine. Do I really want to go through the hassle of fighting these guys for like a hundred dollar card? Maybe not. So I kind of let I let up on it. But yeah, going back to the, the accountability thing, yeah, man, like so brutal. Yeah, what are you supposed? What you know what? For I'm sure there's other people who experience the same thing. And what are you supposed to do, right? Like PSA is going to say, no, sorry, man. It was, you sent it in like that. Or it was the, the mail service or FedEx that kind of dinged it. Like, what am I supposed to say? You packaged it incorrectly. And it could have right. been the grader in the moment. He go, oops. And he dropped the card onto the table and it <laughs> dinged. And he's like, well, you know what? I'll just like package it. And like, there's no accountability. There's none whatsoever. So, you know, I hear you on that. Like, I think That's, PSA does need yeah. some more transparency. For sure. And hopefully we get it. So, but uh, yeah, we'll see how this situation ultimately ultimately plays out. But right. um, yeah, I don't know what else to say beyond that. All right, let's move on then to hobby headlines. So the weather is getting warmer with summer now upon us. So I thought we could talk about our summer strategies when it comes to sports card collecting and investing. And what I mean by that is, you know, does what we look to buy and sell depend on what sports are in season and which ones are in off season. So, you know, for the summer, the NBA and NHL are wrapping up, you know, there's no football until the fall, uh, but we do have baseball as well, as well as other active sports like F1 now, uh, tennis, golf, soccer. Uh, So just curious, in other words, to see what's on your watch list with different sports now in off season and others in full swing. Right. Man, you know, when we recorded a a couple of weeks ago, we were were talking about uh, the market downturn and how to react to it. Um, Yeah. I work in real estate, so uh, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in Toronto right now, the market is correcting, quote unquote, correcting quickly, like percentile Mm -hmm. real estate percentages are going down daily. Um, So it's looking pretty bleak. And then you look at the markets, you look at um, what's going on in the war and, and everything, and it just seems like everybody is uh, hesitant, scared, um, 
you know, saving up their money for a rainy day. So I don't know where sports cards falls in all of this. So in terms of like what I am doing personally, uh, I sold a bunch of cards, uh, getting ready for the, um, we'll see. Like, I mean, getting ready for the sports car show, the expo that's coming in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think we can probably get a pretty good temperature check on the market and purchasing and who's selling, who's buying. Um, and that'll probably give us a better indication of what's going on. But I, I'm probably, I would say I am uh, proceeding with a lot of caution. I think I'm going to kind of wait on the sidelines to see when I can jump sure. jump on. But in terms of uh, watch lists, you know, not to sound like a broken record, but um, Luca is on the list uh, as much as people are harped that he's about to get possibly swept by the Warriors tonight, we'll probably find out the answer after we re- stop recording this. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Soto is on the list. He is not off to the hottest of starts as usual. And I'm hoping that continues all the way to the sports card show. <laughs> right. Uh, and then uh, I also mentioned this before, like I think most of my watch list now, to be honest, is hockey, SP, authentic future watch autos. Uh, mm-hmm. That There's a ton yeah. of future watch autos that's on my list. Um, I am looking to potentially flip a lot of my collection into Future Watch. So something I've been thinking of, I'm just kind of waiting to see. I, the price has to be right for me. So like I mentioned, like guys like Barkov, I'm interested yeah. in. The price has to be right. Um, and I'll look to to possibly trade into it or flip. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, I'm not sure if we talked about it more extensively off air about the whole... Uh, um, strategy to invest in hockey cards, especially the Future Watch autos, which are right. you know uh, number to nine ninety nine limited set and consistent year after year. So you know we all agree that we love that set. But yeah, maybe we can explain a little bit more in detail, like what made you think about going hard in this area. Do you think it's just too cheap, or do you think hockey is going to have a resurgence? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, so. Future Watch autos have always been popular. You know, I remember trying to go after the Sidney Crosby um, yeah. Future Watch auto, and uh, I don't know how it is now because it's it's been a while. But it was incredibly, incredibly tough to hit anybody of any kind of name hmm. uh, auto in, coming out of a hobby box. I think the hobby box was pretty expensive at the time, probably like 150, 200 bucks. You get two Future Watch autos, and there was probably like a 300 to 500 signature checklist so i was getting like neil neil's torkinson autographs and it was just it was like brutal like yeah there's no way you're getting Sidney crosby but anyways um to me it kind of feels like uh, we talked about how opera deck doesn't have a chrome product it doesn't really play in the parallel space as big as uh, prism and topped chrome uh, so people, you can kind of tell, I, I mean, this is just my own opinion, but I feel like people kind of getting bored of Young Guns. It is a base card. Yeah, it's a little bit more of a, like an S, uh, like a short print, like a base versus like Prism and stuff. Um, but it is just like a, like a normal paper base, right? And I think people are looking for something a little bit more special. And the next thing, to, I mean, there are parallels, don't get me wrong, there are par- parallels of Young Guns, but they're extremely tough to get. Uh, and they're very expensive on most players. So the easiest thing to look at next is uh, Future Watch Autos. And it's awesome, right? Because it's it's on card. It's numbered. It's kind of got everything that you really want, right? So, um, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. Like, I've always been a hockey guy. Uh, I haven't really been collecting cards since, like, hockey cards since I was a kid. I think some of that passion is starting to kind of creep back. Uh, I know hockey the most, so it would make sense for me to kind of th- dive into it and at the same time i am yes i am kind of betting that maybe at nhl will have its course and it will have its run at some point um so for me i'm not gonna you know i don't i don't think at this point i'm brave enough to really go all in and start trading thousands of dollars of my (laughs) collection kind of thing Mm -hmm. but if there are some cards that i think are the right buys at the right price um i'll probably make the move so yeah yeah it's, like it's tough to say, man. It's Yeah, it's tough to say if hockey will have its resurgence. I don't know if it's just going to... You know, it's always been number four of the big boy sports. It's not like it's ever really flirted with number three or number two. So I'm not anticipating it's going to like overtake any of the other guys in popularity. 
But in terms of the hobby, maybe there's a chance that there is a bit of a, a, a run up. Yeah, no, you never know, right? Like we just interviewed in our previous episode on Friday uh, with Refractor Jones. And mm -hmm. he was mentioning when he got into the hobby, like in the 80s, it was all only baseball, baseball cards. And no one right. was really talking about basketball. And then, you know, you know, fast forward to, to, to today, you know, basketball cards are hot, right? And, and although, right. you know, it's, it's been seeing a bit of a, bit of a decrease a little bit now, but, um, overall it's been, it's been pretty hot. Um, so, you know, who knows hockey could see the same thing. Uh, the one thing I'm a little nervous about is that I, I can't even remember when the last report came out, but, um, I think soccer is on the verge of being number four. <laughs> I don't know if it's in North American context, right? Right. And you know, I can see that for sure. Well, the article says like the explanation is is, is simple. Um, all you need to do, all you need to play soccer with is just a couple of goalposts and <laughs> pylons and a ball, right? And, and with yeah. hockey, you you know, you need a lot of things, right? <laughs> and you need money for sure to, to get into the league, and that's kind of playing itself out on a global scale. Right. So, right. Um, so yeah, but I'm, I'm having said that I'm still bullish on hockey. I think, um, hockey cards are going to still continue to trend upwards. It might just take time. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I like that. I see that more as, a as a way to going back to our original topic, what I'm doing for summer strategies. Like if you're staying in sports cards and yeah, take all the caveats of what's going on in the world economy these days, but if you're still looking at investing in sports cards, it's just another way to diversify my portfolio, sports card portfolio, because I don't really have a lot of hockey cards, right? And if I want to right. start collecting some hockey cards, I think the Future Watch Auto, that's always been on my radar, you know, like mm -hmm. for all the same reasons you mentioned, on card autos, number to 999, and still relatively cheap for, you know, not the stud stud players like Crosby and such, but for above average or elite players that can take even the next step where you could see that jump in value in the next year or two. Right. Right. So and this is, a, this is another thing to note for some of those that are kind of looking to get into hockey or investing hockey is uh, because it's kind of a bit off the radar uh, in terms of the main big boys. Uh, it's not as volatile, right? So like you said, if you're looking to diversify some of your funds uh, into some safer place, hockey has been relatively safe over the last, you know, it hasn't had, some crazy volatile run-ups like some of the other sure. sports, F1 and NBA, et cetera. Um, but you can say that it's been protected at the same time pretty well, right? Like the Young Guns cards, you know, this whole base is dead. Young Guns is a base card, but it didn't follow the, it didn't follow that trend. True. Kind of hockey kind of has its own little specific market. Um, so as much as it didn't, it hasn't been going up as much as some of the other, and you you maybe couldn't have profited as much. Uh, most people that are in hockey right now probably didn't lose as much uh, in mm -hmm. the last 12 months as those other people who invested in NBA and and, and NFL and et cetera. Et cetera totally right? agree. So yeah. something to think about as well. For sure. Yeah. Um, for me, in terms of summer strategies or, you know, I'm getting ready to go to the expo and make some moves, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, during these times, you know, the mid-tier cards and the lower to mid-tier cards, they're seeing you know, because of the market and how it is, like they're seeing bigger drops, right? And, and you know, mm -hmm. if I can move some of them and you already did that, right? You sold a, a lot of those kind of cards. So you have at least um, um, capital ready to deploy for the bigger cards that right. are also kind of seeing that decrease. So overall, that's kind of my strategy to liquidate what I can um, on the lower to mid tier and then um, have some money to hopefully buy into, you know, the blue chips, so to speak. Um, which right. are also seeing, you know, a good discount, right? Like whether it's your Mike Trout's or, um, you know, McDavid, like uh, I'm sure they're still pretty expensive, but, um, you know, for some, it might, for some collectors, it might be in their range, in their range now to, to actually pull the trigger to add to their collection. Right. So, so yeah, right. like I'm always still looking for Luca, <laughs> like you, um, Tatum, <laughs> um, I'm, yeah. I'm getting greedy. I already have a couple, but I want to just add more during these times, you know, um, <laughs> uh, who else? Um, and, you know, uh, you know, on a side note, like because a lot of collectors are looking to liquidate, um, there are some cards that are 
just a, a lot cheaper than you would expect. So um, you guys know, or our group of collector friends knows that I was um, looking to um, complete the home field advantage subset for the 2022 tops, um, which were the case inserts, right. the Panini downtown ripoffs. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I bought the, I bought Vlad and judge at the peak, you know, for about a hundred, 150 bucks respectively. And now you look at them and all of them are like anywhere from 25 to $50, depending on who the players are. Right. That includes right. Tatis, Acuna, Trout, you know, all those guys. And if the hobby was hot, I'm pretty sure those would be at least double the price, you know? Um, and, Agreed. and now it's like, you know, everyone's like, Oh, it's, you know, they just want to get, it's, if it's not a huge, huge hit, like you see in, um, some of the breakers, uh, YouTube feeds, um, then they just want to just get rid of it for whatever they can get, get it worth. So, you know, set collecting, or, you know, for me in this case, completing a subset becomes a lot more affordable. And I'm just taking advantage of doing that as well. And, uh, I think I did mm -hmm. mention in a previous episode that I was going to do that. And, and, uh, yeah, just a update for you guys. I got all the 10 cards I needed for that home field advantage. So I did complete the set. Um, it's going to look yeah, nice <laughs> when I, when I actually get them in my hand, but, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, again, we were talking to refractor. He's the ultimate set collector and I could see the appeal in it. <laughs> like, you know, I'm not going to hoard thousands, tens of thousands of cards, but you know, like the ones you can manage. Yeah. Like a lot of those subsets are totally doable and, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. So it's a, it's a good time to do that if you wanted to, cause it's, um, all of right. a sudden, more affordable to do to do that kind of thing right. yeah i also um i also have my eye out on i haven't been able to pull the trigger but i have my eye out on female athletes mm, okay. <clears throat> female athletes have always been on my watch list uh i haven't made the move but you know Anyone serena williams serena yeah yeah I, I i a couple of times i watched uh exquisite autos of uh, serena williams Way too expensive. It's so expensive. I, like Serena, high end Serena Williams. I mean, you guys saw uh, the record breaking price of her uh, net pro yeah. like uh, RPA. Like, oh my goodness, that, I don't know what that went for like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. But um, Serena Williams is big. Uh, I was looking at like Candace Parker, a couple of WNBA players, um, Chloe Kim, gotta right. represent the Koreans. She could go down as one of the greatest like female. Yeah. Uh, X game athlete. So I was like, just a couple, you know, I'm not sure if it's PC or investment or both. Um, but yeah, I wanted, I wanted to mention that there are female athletes on my watch list for sure. Yeah. I like that move too. How about golf? I know you, I think a week ago you sent, um, what was his, what was that golfer's name? Uh, uh Morikawa, Colin Morikawa. Right, right, right. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That was a pretty sweet card. Like I, I think there's. Yeah, a... it was the good. It was the good win. The brand new Goodwin uh, Exquisite Auto patch. <clears throat> I think it was a gold numbered out of ten. Went for raw. Sold for like forty, forty five hundred. Wow, yeah, okay. the, the, yeah. Golf is not being slept on, man. People, are, I, I feel like golf. Um, people are attacking golf for sure, with the Seems... anticipation of the Netflix series. Right, right. Do you know when that's yeah, coming out? I was re I don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't even know when's the projected date, but um, yeah, I I only have Tiger and Rory. I wanted to add. I would love to add Colin. I would love to have add Bryson DeChambeau, um, but man, they're they're expensive. So keeping my out. I I they're on my watch list, but yeah, they're not a priority right now. But yeah, yeah. No, I I, I feel that golf is um, golf cards are making um, waves right now. So we'll see how that mm -hmm. goes over the summer, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, before we, yeah, I might regret it. I might regret it sitting here, not buying any <laughs> of them, and then it just explodes in six months. I'm like shit, I should have listened to myself. Oh yeah, we'll record that episode in six months, and, and that'll <laughs> yeah. inevitably happen. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Um, before we move on to our next uh, little segment, uh, any thoughts on F one? What What's your thoughts? Like for me, I feel like. I said this before. I feel like it's not as big as it was even six months ago. So I don't know. Right. I'm still seeing big sales, right? From obviously Lewis cards and uh, Max Verstappen. But right. um, I don't know. I feel like it's, it might just be me. I feel like it's slowing down, but 
It, yeah, it, I mean, I don't know what to say. Like, I mean, I we we talked about this, and we, I mean, we we talked about the fact, you know, when we were comparing F one to like Marvel, mm-hmm. and how as newer sets of F one come out, unless you're into the sport, it's really going to be hard to follow what the latest chase is. Obviously, you'll have influencers talk about it uh, for the time being while it's a hot product, so you can just literally watch a YouTube channel and then find out what who the hot chase is. Um, but who knows what happens with F1 when there's like the third release or the fourth release or the fifth release, right? Um, but when I watch some of the American, uh, like the Dallas card show was just happening, it still looks like F1 is pretty hot in terms of sales. Uh, and when you hear some of the dealers talking about, yeah, the cards that are moving right now is F1. We're buying F1. Like dealers will buy what's moving, right? So dealers are all about buying it and people are trading it and selling it. And then, you know, on the flip side, you know, people, you know, are attending the shows to buy it, buy them up. So it's still, I mean, uh, maybe it's not hot between us talking in right now within the podcast. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> but based on what I'm seeing on uh, social media, it still seems like it's a fairly hot product. Obviously not as hot as the first release when you're talking about quote unquote rookie cards of Lewis Hamilton and Verstappen. Um but it still seems to be fairly, fairly strong from what I'm seeing, okay, which is good yeah. news for those that are in, into F1. Sure, sure. No, yeah. I, I like I'm I'm totally open to being wrong about that, but I just wanted to kind of gauge. You too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I'm. I mean, let's you know get get it straight again. I'm not particularly bullish on F1. Uh, I don't have any F1 on my watch list. Um, but yeah, I'm, if I'm wrong about it, I'm completely okay with being wrong about it. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how the summer unfolds, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it while we're in the summer season, what we're buying, and and especially after the sports card expo here in Toronto, uh, we'll update uh, all our listeners what what happened then. Okay. So we'll move on to our next segment. Um, we don't have a title for it, but it's just more of a promotion that we're um, going to offer for our listeners. As a five card guys, we partnered with Candy Digital, which is a digital collectibles platform. And they've been promoting and selling their MLB NFT packs, right? I think it's called the um, MLB Icon Leadoff Series. And I think they're up to four as of this recording. So they have a leadoff series one, two, three, four. And you can think of these um, series as sets. So each series has a collection of players. So it's a different checklist for each series, right? I got a pack of leadoff series three and um, four... For that particular series, that you could chase the Vladimir Guerrero Jr. card for the for Blue Jays fans. Mm-hmm. So, and you can't get that in series two, one, or four that just came out. But anyway, um, we're gonna do a promo and giving away two free packs to two of our listeners. Uh, we'll post all the details on our Instagram at Cards to the Moon this week. So once you see the post, uh, read the details, and we'll sh- tell you how you can enter, and then we'll draw. We'll draw the winner probably the following week to to receive one of the two free packs. But um, yeah, just uh, just giving you guys an early heads up. But um, you know, for our listeners, if you wanted more information about it, you could go to mlb.candy.com. Um, I don't know, John. You, have you ever heard of these MLB NFT packs from Candy Digital? No, I'll, I'll admit it's my first time. I think I saw some advertisements, but I don't know anything about the product. Is are these so you're saying these are cards, uh, digital cards, and they're not, uh, it's not like Top Shot, right? Where they're like moments? They have, um, yeah, it's kind of uh, a little bit confusing, but um, it is digital cards first and foremost, and they have different right. rarities. So you could think of these as parallels, right? So there's sure. a core, which is kind of the common card. Then they have something mm-hmm. called um, uncommon, and, um, and then it goes to rare, and then it goes to epic, and then the most rare card is the legendary parallel right so and then right. you go on the website you can see what the odds the pack odds are of these um of these cards and um like the cores are just digital cards of the players and uh, you could flip behind the digital card kind of like a physical card and look at the stats but with these nft packs what one of the cool features is that those update those stats are updated daily because of the players in season so if you have them you could always look back at look at the back of the card and the the stats will be updated um for the more totally rare right. cards 
um, there are video highlights that are included in their NFT. So in that way, it's kind of like Top Shots, um, but right. it, it comes with the digital card. So it's a digital card plus a video highlight of featuring that player, right? So, gotcha. so yeah, it's it's um it's kind of cool. And you know, like what I like about it personally uh, is that if you do get a big hit, um, you could put that you could put it for sale on the Candy Digital Marketplace, and it's it's as easy as essentially two or three clicks, uh, name your price, and then it goes up on the marketplace. And if it gets sold, the money goes right into your account. And you know mm-hmm. we talked about the advantages of NFTs in general, but it applies to these NFT cards as well. That once you sell it, you don't have to worry about shipping. You don't have to worry about um, you know on on a buyer standpoint, you don't have to worry about it being a fake because it's um, on the blockchain. And right. so it's very easy to. Um, make your money that way. You know, on the flip side, I'm not going to lie. Some of the common cards or the core cards are worth 50 cents. You know what I mean? Like, um, um, you're not going to make much of it. But at the same time, like, you could still probably sell, like, if anyone's looking to collect certain players um, to complete whatever set that they're going after, you know, they could buy it easily Mm -hmm. for 50 cents. You're not going to do that in real life. You're not going to sell comments through the mail, right? Like, those are... Yeah, those yeah, are yeah. garbage at that point or junk. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. true. So that's another advantage of these digital cards. But anyway, um, yeah, we're gonna give away two free packs to two of our listeners. If you're interested, look for the details on our Instagram post at Cards to the Moon later this week. All right. Awesome. Um, so we'll finish off this episode with our regular weekly feature we call Pick One. All right. So it's just me and you, John. And um, I saw what mm-hmm. your pick one was, and I want to up my pick one as well. So <laughs> it'll be fun to see what we decide. But uh, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let the listeners know what we have for our extravagant pick one <laughs> today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I've got the hypothetical pick one, but we're <laughs> gonna go with uh, Holy Grail Luca card. Yeah. Um, let's say it's you know whatever your Holy Grail is. Well, let's call it the. The, the National Treasures Logo Man RPA, which sold for $4.6 or whatever it sold for, mm-hmm. versus all the entire stock of Luca Prism Silver PSA 10 with a market cap floating in and around $5 million. So do you okay. get the singular Holy Grail or do you get the entire market cap of Prism Silver Luca PSA 10s? And it doesn't have to, you know, for the sake of argument... Uh, let's say that the values are exactly the same and it doesn't have to be Luca. It could be any other player. The point is singular Holy Grail card or an entire stock of silver uh, PSA 10s. Right. Yeah, when I first saw this in our show notes, like it was easy for me. Like, you know, it's one of those things where you just know you decide right away. And um, right. so at equal value. So one Holy Grail, let's say it's worth 5 million and then the whole... Right. Um, market or the whole set the whole you know for for this case the whole luca prism silver psa 10 um would have equal right. value currently right so you know for me initially i said oh i'll just go for the one holy grail card that's that's a you know for me that'd be amazing and personally you know i would want to do that right 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 but then you know as i was giving my kids a bath i was kind of thinking about the question further <laughs> like what do I, uh, what's the advantage of the other way and then um then I thought, like, if I had all the PSA 10 Luca Prism Silvers, you know, if I captured the market that way, I could essentially dictate the price of that card, right? right. So it might be worth $5 million right now, but, you know, it, I think it's still pretty liquid. I think there's, if there's, you know, if it's like a Silver Prism Luca where I feel like there's always going to be demand, you know, why not increase the price a little bit? <laughs> because I have all the cards, you know? So I think... In right. that sense, for pure value play, uh, I would I would want all the prisms silvers, um, you know, if there were liquid, if there were demand for it, a good demand for it, because I right. feel like I could make a way more in a shorter period of time that way. D- mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely, man. <laughs> uh, you know what? All two thousand of the cards. Yeah, I just <laughs> sell them yeah, yeah. at my price. That's right. It's like a pop population of like t- just over 2,100. Right. 
So I, I thought about this. This was a fun one. Like when it popped up in my mind, I'm like, man, you know, it, it really sucks that Hyung's not here because I would have loved to have his opinion on mm-hmm. it too. But I'm with you, man. Uh, I think <laughs> on a personal level, the logo man would, the RPA would be incredible. Come on, like holy grail, Luca would be incredible. But there is something about hypothetically owning the entire stock <laughs> of silver. Like you're just, you know, you've never had an opportunity to wield that kind of power. You know, I feel like right. if you did have that stock, you would be like Pharma Bro. You remember Pharma Bro? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who like just like dictates the market and is just like this big, big time jackass that just like rips everybody off. I'm like, man, for once in my life, maybe I want to wield that kind of power. <laughs> So I, I'm gonna pick the silver too, but you know, on the on the flip side, if you know, obviously there's nobody that could ever even ob- obtain it because it's just impossible to try to get them all at once. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's say you did. On the flip side, I would say if you were because at that point with social media being the way they are, somebody would know at some point that Clark, five card guys, you're the one that's holding all of them, and you're ripping people off off. And you're, you know, you're your sports card bro. Like you're the guy. You're the dude that's the <laughs> the jackass, right? And then I think that the marketing of that product might tank, right? Like maybe there's a situation where the mm, entire market's like, you know what? Let's let's screw over Pharma Boy, let this this idiot, and let's make his market cap of that card literally go to zero, right? So I feel like on the flip side, there could be some negative Ooh. marketing that comes your way because you're greedy and because you want to be a jackass. Yeah, so yeah. I'll play the flip side on that. Um, you know, obviously it's a completely unrealistic uh, possibility, but I would like to dream that <laughs> it'd be fun. It'd be you fun to what? wield that power for for five minutes. You know what? I changed my mind. I, I I'm going to go with the RPA because you can totally <laughs> see that happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm gonna have to. I can't give him away at at some point in that scenario. So. Okay, um, so I'm going RPA. <laughs> You're sticking with the, 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 the whole... For fun, I am sticking with it, but I'm, I, I scared myself too. I'm like, oh, actually, I don't know. <laughs> or, or uh, and we'll move on after this because it's pure hypothetical, but um, <laughs> I was thinking I couldn't even sell them one at a time because, you know, if you do, more people are going to have that card and then there's market dynamics involved, right? So I got to sell all right, of them right. at the same time for a slightly higher <laughs> Which price. Which you can't. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah, or it's very limited to who I can sell to at that point, right? So right. maybe, maybe uh, Logan Paul. I don't know, but um, one, yeah, one giant PWCC lot, investor lot, investor lot. Yeah, that's that's the only way. <laughs> if I can do that, I'll do that. All right. Um, okay, yeah. so after seeing that, I'm like, okay, I want to think of uh, an extravagant pick one as well. So the one I thought about is Mario Lemieux OPG rookie card PSA ten, right? Population count forty eight, and on Card Ladder it was selling, on average for about forty six thousand dollars. Okay, right. so forty eight pop count of the Mario Lemieux OPG rookie card PSA ten, versus the Connor McDavid twenty sixteen seventeen the Cup top ten picks autograph card. It's a one of one, and it's graded BGS nine five True Gem Plus. So. Mm. What I'm really going after is, do you go for the McDavid one of one card? And it's not the cup. It's like a subset of the cup, but still one of one. Right. And it's uh, graded in a BGS gem, true gem plus. And uh, versus the 48 pop count of Mario Lemieux rookie card. Right. 2016. That's is that a rook? That's not the rookie year though, right? I don't believe it is, no. Okay. So it's just like a the cup one of one okay 46 <clears throat> we talked about mcdavid we talked about how generational he is and how special he is okay before you go on before you go on i'm gonna yeah. add just like you it doesn't have to be that particular card i just want to get fair comps at 46k but sure, imagine sure. It's okay, a okay. super fractor one of one um of mcdavid and it's not, it right. doesn't even have to be a rookie card it's just a super fractor but it's right it's a one of one. Ooh. okay i see what you're saying that was like a lead. That was like a lead-in comment because I think you felt where I was about to go with it. <laughs> um, ooh, I might be wrong on this, but the collector side of me 
and the OG collector side of me can't I can't go away from the Mario Lemieux. I can't I cannot. <laughs> that is too much. The PSA 10 is too much of a grail card. Um and for you know the, truthfully for what it is and how much the Wayne Gretzky goes for it, and I I understand Wayne Gretzky is 79. It's a bit of a different like era in terms of pop count like production in general and then you've got the pop count PSA 10 at like 2 which I will bet any money one of them is probably owned by Wayne Gwen Gretzky or <laughs> right. Dustin Johnson um versus Pop 48 but for who Mario Lemieux is to me that card is easily a six figure card should be a six figure card so to see it at 46,000 I think it's very very undervalued and underrated and how much of a grail card that is um a one of one McDavid oh man I, I think people can easily make the argument the other way based mm-hmm. on the trajectory that McDavid's going on. Uh, but I can't for me I can't get I can't get away as a collector that OG Mario Lemieux OPC rookie PSA ten that is a holy grail card for me. I can't go away from it. I gotta pick. I gotta I gotta go with Mario Lemieux. Okay. Just curious uh, since we're playing hypotheticals, if the pop count was five hundred, would that sway your mind? Um. Yeah, you know what? Truthfully, if the podcast was five hundred, that would sway my mind. I'll probably go to a McDavid at that point. Okay. So pop forty eight. Pop forty eight is that is low, man. That is really sure. rare. Yeah. So not even the one <clears throat> of one, which is obviously you know uh, a sweet, pretty sweet card, can sway you. <laughs> and it's a McDavid. Yeah. You know okay. if it, if this was yeah, if this was like a rookie, a rookie card. Actually, I don't know because like a, a rookie one of one would be like two hundred fifty thousand dollars or whatever it would cost. Okay, so you know what? Let's play sense. that game. I, rookie, I, uh, McDavid rookie. I, I don't know if these exist, right? But McDavid rookie one of one, quarter of a million right. versus a Gretzky PSA nine. I don't know, right? Um, right. With a pop count of like just under a hundred. Right. And you know what? At, at that point, if we're talking rookie cards and we're talking you know, like upper echelon percentile high end McDavid. At that point, I'm going to pick, I will pick McDavid. Yeah. I think he, it's tough to say he, he's 100% generational. I think he has to win some, at least one cup to get into conversation of starting to get into the conversation of like best hockey players of all time. Skill wise, you can make that argument. Um, but you know, like some of the the players these days, like Johnny Goudreau is possibly skill wise better than ninety percent of the league twenty years ago, right? Like you know, you know what I'm saying. So, um, but based on who McDavid is, yeah, if you if you own like the upper upper echelon of McDavid, I would certainly take that. That to me, that would be a no brainer over like a PSA nine Wayne Gretzky. As much as that is kind of like a holy grail card for a collector. Um, I think the modern game and where collectability and where, you know, we're both bullish on where sports cards is going to go. And McDavid is certainly going to be top of mind uh, for old collectors right now and even for new collectors. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it would make sense, a lot more sense to go after, at that point, go after the McDavid. Okay. You got me, man. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to change a few parameters for me to finally get you. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's, it would have been boring otherwise because I'm going for Mario Lemieux too. It's just the purest in me to get that rookie card, and probably nostalgia reasons as well. So I'm asking the wrong guy. I'm asking myself, you know, as well. I'm kind of in that right. same boat, right? But um, yeah, with Lemieux, the pop count of 48. But I was I was kind of trying to make it work with Gretzky, but you know, at the PSA 10 level, it's Gretzky. Like, there's only two of them, right? So, I know like, it's so it's so tough to say. I you know, can't find good right? comps for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was hard to make that match, but yeah, I'm going with Lemieux as well. Although I like McDavid, um, right? But it's funny. This, I'm surprised. This... I thought I thought you were trying to lead me into agreeing with you. I didn't realize you were also <laughs> going to pick Mario Lemieux. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, um, I didn't want to sweep. I guess. But 
All right, um, this is what happens when Hyung's not on the show. This is the pick ones that we come up with. When <laughs> unrealistic <laughs> ones. <laughs> I think we need Hyung back on the show to bring us back I know. to reality. We go off the rails, go- Clark and I. <laughs> that is true. All right, it is a shorter episode uh, today because uh, we are missing one person um, adding their um, input. Uh, but uh, we'll have Hyung back next week. But uh, thanks again for all our listeners. As always, if you haven't subscribed to our to our podcast, uh, we really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this episode, if you gave us five stars, that would help us help us out a lot. And uh, yeah, looking forward to connecting with you again next Tuesday when we drop another new episode. Thanks, bye. Hey, thanks for listening to Cards to the Moon. We'd really appreciate you subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also connect with each of us on Instagram at Five Card Guys, or you can follow Hyung at Integrity Sports Cards, or John at Trade You at Recess. You can also check us out at FiveCardGuys.com. Thanks again, and hope to connect soon.